As a community, we build empathy, curiosity, joy, and connection when we share stories with you. Welcome to Storytellers Project, part of the USA Today Network. During this crisis, millions of Americans are struggling to afford food for their children. No Kid Hungry is here to help. We're working with organizations nationwide to feed children during and beyond this crisis. If you need help, simply visit nokidhungry.org slash help to find free meals for your kids. No questions asked, no registration needed. It's just healthy food for kids who need it. Go to nokidhungry.org slash help today. Hi, I'm Megan Finnerty of USA Today. I'm the founder and director of the Storytellers Project, and we so appreciate you sharing your evening with us. Tonight, we're joining Humana, No Kid Hungry, and six Americans from across the nation to create community. Since 2016, the Storytellers Project has brought more than 100 shows each year to communities across the country. But we've canceled our in-person season because, well, well, you know, the ongoing pandemic. So that brings us to today's theme. We have handpicked incredible storytellers and inspiring people to bring you a show about back to school and in partnership with No Kid Hungry, all the rebuilding and reimagining that that requires. We promise you a charming, funny, and relatable show that is also going to be touching and inspiring. So let's get right into it. I want to introduce you to our storytellers. Tonight, we're go you're going to hear from Tucker Dupree, a four-time swimming medalist at the Paralympics coming to us from Chicago. Hi, Tucker. Hey. Thanks for being here. Chris Thanks for Howlett. having me. Oh, right. Chris Howlett is coming to us from Louisville, where he's an IT professional. Hi, Chris. Hello. Lydia, hi. Lydia Seitz is a technology project manager from Cincinnati. Hi, Lydia. Hi, everybody. And I was Listen to Lydia's story, man. You can everyone can relate to her story. I I, I know I can. Um, Peggy Lawrence is a school nutrition director from the Rockdale County Public Schools in Atlanta. Hi, Peggy. Hey there. Juan Carlos Luna Vargas is coming to us from Rialto, California, where he is literally in his classroom. Hi. Hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> Right, he's taking back to school so seriously. Um, he's literally back there. Um, George Baker is a muralist from Atlanta. We're lucky to have him here tonight. And hey, in guys. The of, in the middle of the show, we're going to hear from Pamela Taylor. She's the Chief Communications and Marketing Officer for No Kid Hungry, and she's going to help us understand a little bit more how we can help our neighbors. Thank you all for being part of this storytelling show. Awesome. So like I mentioned just a second ago, tonight's show benefits No Kid Hungry. You can donate right this second at nokidhungry.org slash USA Today. But we also really just appreciate you being here to raise awareness. Not everybody knows all the ways in which No Kid Hungry helps connect kids and their communities with food and resources. And that's really why Humana is, um, has sort of fomented tonight's partnership, because one in six kids today could face hunger because of the coronavirus and its impacts on all of us. In the wake of the pandemic, millions of children are living with hunger. And they can be kids, you know, like you don't, as you'll hear tonight, you don't always know who's hungry. And so rebuilding starts with feeding every child in every community. So, like I mentioned, with support from Humana, No Kid Hungry is helping schools and communities get the food they need and the support and equipment they need to feed kids. Humana is proud to support No Kid Hungry in helping to connect kids to healthy meals. And they are literally making any donations you make um, over the next little bit in connection with with the show, they're going to make it go further because they're going to match up to $25,000. So like no pressure, you don't have to give right now, but like if you wanted to, if you click on, you know, nokidhungry.org slash USA Today, Humana will match your donation. Child hunger is a really real problem in America, but we know, and this is my favorite thing about this partnership, there are actually workable solutions, which I feel like is something to really cling to right now when it can feel like there are big problems that don't have big answers. Well, No Get Hungry Lake has figured it out. They are they and their experts are partners, or they and their partners are experts, excuse me, at making solutions work. And the crisis has shown us all that unemployment and hunger can touch any family anywhere at any time. And so I really mean it when I say this, like it's really on all of us to show up for our communities and make sure that the kids in those communities get the food they need, regardless of their circumstance. And No Kid Hungry is singularly focused on fighting childhood hunger and ending it. Through emergency grants, hands-on guidance, and rallying the right people, people like us actually, they're helping put meals on the table for hungry children. And again, you can be part of the solution at nokidhungry.org slash USA Today. 
But tonight, you guys know, is not a TED Talk. It's not a Toastmasters. It's not a House 2 speech or a slideshow. We are really just here to connect with you emotionally, help you understand your neighbors, help you feel closer to the people around you. Because storytelling is about visiting. You open your heart and your mind and you pay attention to a person that you care about and who you wanna feel closer to. So we're really inviting you to do that tonight. Some of our storytellers tonight are gonna to be super polished and professional and hilarious. Others are gonna be more casual and conversational and really touching. We ask you to receive all of them because that's how community connection really happens. We at the USA Today Network believe creating empathy and understanding is vital, especially in times of uncertainty. So we are thrilled to welcome up our first storyteller. Tucker, take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Um, growing up in North Carolina, I feel like I lived a pretty ordinary life. I went to school, I hung out with my friends, and my parents realized at a very young age that I had a lot of energy and I needed to find something to keep me out of trouble. So after that, whole piece, I um, had the great opportunity to try all different types of sports. I played soccer, I ran cross country, I was on the basketball team, and the timing worked out to where my sister was a senior when I was a freshman in high school. So that meant she drove us to school every day. That also meant that she drove us everywhere she wanted to go after school. So my sister was on the high school swim team. Well. I did not want to swim because it just wasn't my sport, but I sat in the stands every day while she was at swim practice and the coach would come up to me and ask me, you know, hey, you're here, you might as well get in. And I would always come up with clever comebacks like, ah, I don't really want to get in and swim because I can't imagine doing a sport in a little bitty speedo. Well, after all the bugging me and asking me every day why I'm not getting in, I finally caved and said, all right, fine, I'll get in. So I showed up the next day with a swimsuited hand and a stomach full of courage. And I got in the pool and pushed off for my first lap of competitive swimming. And a lot of people that saw that first lap of swimming kind of referred to it as controlled drowning. Well, I got to the other side of the pool, huddled onto the wall and looked back at the other side and thought, do people really enjoy doing this? And the coach came over to me and said, you know, hey, here's a couple pointers. Try these things out if you enjoy it you know, hopefully you'll stay around. After those few pointers, I was able to continue to swim more laps of swimming and I was hooked. Well, fast forward to my senior year of high school, I was the team captain of the swim team. I had multiple school records and I had the opportunity to swim in division one college. So I went from the slowest kid on the team to having an opportunity to where this sport was gonna actually pay for my education. Well, I woke up on October 18, 2006, rubbing my right eye, looking out my left eye, and I noticed that I couldn't see a sticker on my closet door. I got out of bed, went into the kitchen, started eating breakfast, and my mom, who was an educator at the time, she was getting ready for her school day, and I just mentioned to her, I said, hey, for some reason, the middle of my eye is kind of like starry. It's like, like black almost in the end, like the middle. She was like, okay, that's interesting. She was like, go to school. If it's still bothering you, give me a call and we'll go to the eye doctor. So I grabbed my car keys, got in the car, went to school, didn't really think that much out of it for the rest of the day, got back in my car, covered my right eye and did a quick eye exam. And I noticed I couldn't see the emblem in the middle of my steering wheel. Mind you, this is 2006. I reach over, I grabbed my flip phone, called my mom. And I said, hey, my eye's still bothering me. Can we go to the eye doctor? She was like, absolutely. We're the, next, we're the last appointment of the day. So we met at home. We went to the eye doctor. And that day kicked off about two months of testing. I was seeing all different specialists. Everyone was trying to figure out why I couldn't see. I was going to Duke Eye Care Center, which is a teaching hospital. And so every time I would go to these appointments, I had this proactive mindset of, I'm going to show up. They're going to figure out what it is. And then I'm going to go home and everything's going to be fine. Well, after a while, sitting in front of multiple specialists, it kind of started to feel kind of like I was turning into a zoo exhibit. Every time I came in, it was like everyone had to come see why I couldn't see. Well, about a couple weeks later, my mom got a phone call and they figured out why I was losing my vision. So we all met at home. We drove out to Duke Eye Care Center for one last time. I walked into that doctor's office. I sat down in the chair. They did a couple quick exams and they all sat down and took a deep breath and said, okay, we figured out why you're losing your vision. You have a rare condition called Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy 
at that time, I was one of 9,000 people in human history to have this condition. And I was being told that losing your vision is depressing. It's something that there isn't treatment for right now for your condition and that I would never live an ordinary life. People would need to drive me around because there was the possibility of me going completely blind. And after the rest of the diagnosis, diagnosis was being read to me, I kind of zoned out and just kind of sat there thinking, I have to go swim in college. I, there's got to be more to this. There's got to be better things. So anybody that knows my family, um, they know that we're a very loud family. Um, and that car ride home from that doctor's appointment is hands down one of the quietest car rides we've ever had. When we got home, we had the conversation around, what do you need from us? And I, I just told my parents, I really need to keep swimming. And I, I say that because the sport of swimming is very cathartic. I put my face in the water. I didn't have to tell anybody why I was losing my vision and I could basically go on about my day. Well, Fast forward to February, I was driving home and I was right outside my parents' neighborhood and I noticed that I couldn't see the stoplight out of either eye. Thankfully, I was able to drive home safely. I pulled into my parents' driveway, I took the keys out of the ignition of the car and I reached back and I pulled my wallet out and I took out my driver's license and I held them in my hand. And I remember sitting there thinking, this is the last time I'll ever get to sit here. I opened the car door. I walked into my parents' house and I took my car keys and I passed them across the counter to my mom. And I looked at her and I just said, that's it. She looked back at me confused and said, what do you mean that's it? I was like, I don't want to drive anymore knowing I had this choice to give up my driver's license. Hurting myself or hurting someone else is something I just know I can never live with. And it's not safe for me to drive anymore. Well, my mom was an educator, so she was like, all right, well, well, I'll talk to my principal and we'll figure out a way where I can come get you during my lunch hour or whatever it is. You can come to my school and then I'll take you to some practice after school. Well, we started to do some outreach and we found out that there was a blind school in my area. And so I went to this blind school to kind of relearn some of the things that I might need to know how to do if I did go completely blind. And word got around that I was an athlete. So after that, I started having people ask me questions. Have you ever heard of the Paralympics? And I was like, never heard of the Paralympics. And they're like, well, it's the same thing as the Olympics, but it's for people with physical disabilities. And I was like, okay, how do I get involved? So I did a quick Google search, found out that there was a competition in Vancouver, Canada. So I flew up to Vancouver, Canada with my swim coach and I swam my first Paralympic swim meet. After I swam my first Paralympic swim meet, I swam five events. And I broke five American records, five Pan American records, and I was put on the US national team. And I was also the fastest blind swimmer the United States had seen in over 35 years. What does that mean? 2008 was coming around the corner, which was Beijing, China. So I went to Beijing Paralympic trials and I was the fourth male named to the team. Um, after I swam the Beijing Paralympic games, I finished fourth. Um, as my best finish. And I signed up for four more years where I got to compete in the London 2012 games. And I won a silver medal in the 100 backstroke, a bronze medal in the 50 freestyle, and a bronze medal in the 100 freestyle. I later on swam four more years to the Rio games in 2016, where I won a bronze medal in the 100 backstroke. A lot of people ask me, what is it like to swim um, with 80% of your vision gone? So I always tell people, if you ball up your fists like this, Put that in front of your eyes and look past your hands. That's what my vision is like. So when I'm swimming down the pool, I'm counting every stroke and I'm looking out at my peripheral vision to find out where I'm at in the pool. Well, when I swam the 100 backstroke in Rio, I finished the wall. And since I'm swimming against people that are also visually impaired, none of us can look at the scoreboard and know who won. So we're all kind of looking around at each other like, did you win? Uh? <laughs> so... I got out of the pool where I was greeted by someone um, that was holding all my things after my race. And they looked at me and said, Tucker from USA, you want a bronze medal? If you could please come back to receive your medal at this time, um, we'll meet you over in that area. I was like, awesome. So I go back to the team area. I put on my team uniform. I go stand on the podium. And this bronze medal was put around my neck. I remember sitting there thinking about all the endless workouts, all the things that happened to me, all of those times where I was like, am I really doing this? Is this really something I enjoy? And I knew that it was for this medal. 
and all the people that have helped me get there to that moment. After finishing the national anthem of Ukraine, we walk down the side of the pool and there's all the photographers. So you take all your pictures. And then after that, there's this long hallway back to the team area where you're alone. I remember walking down that hallway, looking down at this medal and thinking that that doctor was completely right in 2006. My life wasn't gonna be ordinary. My life's been extraordinary. Thank you so much. Tucker! Also, we love that. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your story. Yes. Also, can we give a shout out that the Paralympics started just a second ago? Are you cheering people on and feeling it in your heart? Yes, absolutely. Cheering all teammates on. Excited to see some medals come home for Team USA already. Some world records are being broken. Tis the season. I was just going to say, it is. It's like, um, it's a bright spot in a, I think, a tricky news cycle right now. So, um, yes. T Tucker, thank you so, so much for getting us kicked off in style and truly for like modeling a level of teenage resiliency that I pray I see in all the kids I know. Like, my gosh. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is an awesome night and uh, excited to be a part of something so great. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tucker. I am too. Um, with that, I want to spend just a second thinking, um, also guys, I'm so, I am so excited about Tucker, right? Like Paralympian, gold medals, like what an honor to be working with him. I don't mean to be too fangirly, but still. Um, Humana is sponsoring the storytelling shows. You guys know this virtually, but they started sponsoring us in 2019. And we really appreciate that they believe so much in sharing stories and how it makes for healthier people and healthier communities, that they have stuck with us during the pandemic, that they bring us partnerships like this one with No Kid Hungry. We really appreciate this uh, this work we're able to do with them. We need these connections we know to each other and to our health now more than ever. As coronavirus, COVID-19 vaccines become available where you live, Humana would like you to consider talking to your healthcare professional about what's right for you. You can visit Humana.com to learn more about what they're doing each day and to connect you to better health in your community. So thank you so much to Humana for supporting this show in up specifically. And for matching any donations, I'm going to mention it again. If you want to go to nokidhungry.com slash you or nokidhungry.org slash USA Today, Humana will match your donations up to $25,000. But also, even if you don't donate today for any reason, we're just happy that you know about No Kid Hungry and their mission. So thanks so much, Humana, for helping us spread the word. With that, I'm going to bring up our second storyteller. George is here from Atlanta to talk about art and how it changed his life. Okay. Yes. So it's second grade. I'm in my art class. Um, you know, chalkboard dust is all throughout the air. You can hear the scratching of markers onto uh, white sheets of paper. And of course, there's a little kid in the back eating Elmer's glue because that's always what happens in these situations. But then, you know, there's me at my little desk with my white sheet of paper, just drawing away. And, and for me at this time, this is the best place that I could ever be. This is the opportunity that I have to kind of create my own world, um, to showcase who I am. It's, it's really where I get like nothing but great energy out of. And as I'm drawing, I see out the corner of my eye, my second grade art teacher just walking over towards me. And so I'm kind of getting excited because I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to really just show off what I have here. Right. Um, and so she comes up to me and she sees some of the, you know, shapes and figures that I'm drawing. And mind you, I, I wasn't really drawing realistic things. I was kind of drawing these like cartoon characters that I kind of came up with, you know, from my own from my own mind and heart. And my teacher says, oh, well, what are you working on? I was like, oh, you know, I'm just drawing. Um, I kind of want to be an artist once I grow up. And so she she kind of gives me this look of like, okay, um, it's kind of, she says, that's kind of funny. Um, I don't really think that you can be an artist. Um, your stuff doesn't really look realistic. And man, I can tell you at that moment, I was just immediately crestfallen. It was like, if there was a DJ inside of the classroom, the record would have scratched. It was, it was, totally, totally mind blowing. Um, and I could really feel like this, this, this spark that I had in me just slowly, slowly fading away. And I just, I, 
I didn't know what to do. You know, I that was my dream at that point. I just wanted to be an artist. I wanted to express myself in that way. But to hear from my teacher that I couldn't, oh, I was lost. But for some odd reason, that there was a sense within me that, okay, this this can't fully be right. Like I, I think I need a second opinion. So literally, right after the school bell rang, I I dart over to the library, and I'm in there, and you know, of course, in this library, there is a mass amount of books, and then there is every single every single shelf is just is littered with nothing but um, all the different characters that are actually, you know, there for each each entire shelf. So, you know, on the history shelf, you got Napoleon, you got George Washington. And then I see the art shelf that has Picasso and, and Michelangelo. And, you know, once again, I'm kind of getting this feeling of like, well, I think, I still think she may be right, but let me go try anyway. You know, so I'm, I'm going through as many books. I'm pulling everything, you know, a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of beige, beige spines that are just showcasing me all these incredibly realistic works uh, from Michelangelo, from Picasso, from Chuck Close. And I'm just like, man, I, I think this lady may be right. <laughs> and, you know, just as I'm saying that out of the corner of my eye, I just see this beautifully adorned hot pink spine that is on the shelf. And of course, I'm a kid. That is immediately going to attract me. So I'm just, I take a beeline right over there. And as soon as I pull it out, I see it's the artwork of the illustrious Keith Haring. And for those that don't know, his, his artwork is very bright and vibrant and all these bold colors and lines and nothing in there looks realistic at all. And mind you, he is he has done work not only in New York, but he's in galleries. He's overseas in Berlin painting these large murals. And I'm like, oh, all right, I got the plan. <laughs> Immediately take it over to the librarian. I rent it out and I'm jetting home because I cannot wait to go and see my teacher in the morning. So I walk into the classroom the very next day, book in hand, book bag. I'm not even caring. I don't, I don't even care about the contents inside of there because at this point, that doesn't matter. This book and this teacher are about to meet. So I go over to her desk. All the students are falling away and I just, boom, slam the book right on her desk and I look her right in her eyes, tell her, you're wrong. Keith Har Keith Haring is an international muralist, and his, none of his works look realistic. So I can be an artist just like him. And I walk away, and man, I can tell you at this moment, man, my chest is just puffed up. Like I feel like I got, I feel like I got two packs up here and six packs down there, and I'm just strolling beautifully over to my desk. And as soon as I sit down, I look at the teacher, and she is just fuming. Just like, uh, uh, George, I'm going to call your parents. And so, you know, just just as as mighty as I felt, I have never felt as as scared as I <laughs> as I did that day, because if, if anybody knows one of the worst things that can ever happen while you're in school or really away from your parents is somebody saying, I'm going to call your parents. So I'm just like, oh. Okay, and all <laughs> all that puffed up chest, oh man, I'm just sunk right back in. And so, man, I can tell you right now, that was one of the longest, longest bus rides home. Um, I felt like I felt every speed bump going home. I get dropped off and man, it just feels like the distance between my bus stop and the doorstep is just <laughs> impeccably long. And uh, I'm just, dragging my feet, dropping my keys to get inside. And I'm like, you know what? It's okay. I'm just, just going to commit. So I finally walk in and I can hear my mom in the kitchen cooking. And so I'm like, all right, well, I could just run upstairs. We'll deal with this later. 
I know something is coming and I'm, I may not like it, but I decide to actually just go over to my mom and, and try to tell her what's going on. So I walk in the kitchen and I see her and I'm like, mom, and she immediately interrupts me. And she says, hey, I heard about what happened today and there's no need to explain. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> She's like, yes, there's no need to explain at all. That teacher was wrong. And you were definitely right in, in what you did and how you expressed yourself. She was like, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, there's gonna be more experiences that you'll have like that in your life where everybody around you is telling you that you're wrong in what you believe in and you're wrong in what you're doing, but you know, you know yourself way better than, than anybody on this earth. And if you believe in it, then I want you to continue to do just that. Find the evidence, not for anybody else, but for yourself and just live out the dream that you want. So <laughs> now, what, some 23, 28, tw what, 23, 24 years later, now I am 20 feet high in the sky on ladders and on lifts, painting murals, painting a mural for No Kid Hungry. And I'm just mind blown at, at where, this, where this life has kind of taken me. And, you know, I look back and the only thing that I can really think about is, you know, I'm still just that same little George that found that, that hot pink Keith Haring book. And, and funny enough, I'm following in right in his footsteps of being a muralist. It's not something that I would have predicted, but one thing that I would have predicted is I'm still that same little kid drawing away and creating my own universe. Thank you. Oh, George, thank you. Thank you for your story. Thank you for your work, your creativity. Man, thank you for your childhood boldness. <laughs> Had to. Hey, man, the teacher was trying to take away my dream. <laughs> I literally hear that. I just want you to know, I would have just like cried and like slinked off. I was like, oh my gosh, George. So what a self-possessed young man you were. I'm, just, I'm so impressed. Oh my gosh. Oh, but thank also, you. thank you so much for work with No Kid Hungry. Um, do you want to just tell everybody yes. real quick, like where the mural is, if they're in the greater Atlanta area and they can drive by and see it? Yes, yes. So um, I worked on this mural with No Kid Hungry um, that is called We Are All Hungry for Connection. And actually, it is in the downtown Atlanta area, right on Edgewood. Um, I think it's 468 Edgewood Avenue. Yes. Yeah, so please come and check it out. And hey, hey love to see y'all. Awesome. Thank you so much, George. Thanks for your story. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about No Good Hungry and their connection to tonight's show. And uh, the reason is because you probably know this, but like we have a lot of food in America, right? Our, our farms and our factories are great at making us the food we need. And we also have nutrition programs that work. The problem is that not enough children have access to them, right? It's, it's connecting people together. And that's really the magic of No Kid Hungry. They give schools and community groups the funds and guidance needed to launch and grow programs that literally feed more kids. It includes everyday things that maybe you know about, like school breakfast, summer meals served at schools and inside community centers. It's also after school meals. It's emergency feeding programs during times of crisis. So no Kid Hungry is really special because they do research and then they advocate for solutions that work. And we're actually going to hear a little bit more about that from Pamela later on in our show. Really inspiring details on what they learned during the pandemic and what changes they were able to create that are enduring. So what we want you to know is when you donate to No Kid Hungry, you, can, you are literally helping to break down the barriers that stand between hungry kids and healthy meals. This is like, these are the people, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, consider donating at nokidhungry.org slash USA Today. And again, if you can't donate today, we just appreciate your attention and, um, and your awareness of the issue. With that in my heart, I'm excited to bring up our next storyteller, Peggy. She's here on behalf of the um, Georgia Public School system, or District that we mentioned earlier. Peggy's schools were grant recipients of funds that were used for mobile feeding equipment 
And like, she's going to talk about that a little bit in her story. So I don't want to give anything away, but she did say that No Kid Hungry support was really powerful in the way that it helped pay for and coordinate so many of the logistics and all the fine print. Peggy, now, are you going to get into some of that fine print? Sure. Yes. Thank you okay. so much, Megan. Thanks for having Thank me. You. And um, I really, you know, appreciate this opportunity to share a little bit about our story and what we've been able to do for kids in our community um, during this past year. And George, uh, is, you can count on me being at 468 Edgewood Avenue very soon to see your work firsthand. Um, it's just been an amazing experience this last um, 16, 17, 18 months or so. So I um, want to share with you a little bit about how our school district and our school meal program has um, responded to the needs of kids in our community and what we've been able to do with the help of um, all of our partners in, within our school district, within our community, our families, and um, certainly with some support from No Kid Hungry. So March the 12th of 2020, I was sitting um, in a school board meeting here in our school system and um, got taken aside just before the meeting started and told, listen, um, we're about to announce that school's closing for the next two weeks. And um, start to get your head around that, Peggy, the meeting you know, is about to start. And so as the um, executive director of school nutrition here in our school system um, of about 16,000 students, started to think, okay, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna, how are we gonna get our head around this? <clears throat> and how are we gonna be able to respond to our kids? A lot of our students count on school meals. You know, kids come to school for lots of reasons other than academics, lots of services and things. And really just to, to speak to the theme of, of George's mural as well, they come for connection, relationships, people, teachers, students, just that whole feeling um, of connection that happens within a school building. But food is a big deal to, to all of us, and food's a really big deal to our students. And so as I sat through that meeting, began to formulate a plan, um, by the time the, that meeting was over, I got um, out to my car, started, uh, made a couple of phone calls, you know, to, to two of our key cafeteria managers who had run our summer meal program in the past. Both of them immediately agreed to, um, to come on board and start working <clears throat> that following week. Um, and really by the end of that evening, we sort of had a plan put together. You can imagine the logistics that go into suddenly taking meals out into the community um, from being, you know, in our buildings and having our kids come to us and suddenly we're going to them. We have done summer, summer feeding for the last, um, we had done at that point for, for um, six, six or seven prior years. We had some experience and that's really kind of the model that I based our, um, our next, you know, our next phase. But I knew we had to get to our kids. I knew that meal pickups and things like that just were not going to work, um, you know, for our students that we had to get to them. And so that, that Sunday, as, as communication went out from our district, the call started coming in. My phone number was the one that was given out to all of our families. And that Sunday afternoon on March, <clears throat> March the 16th, March the 15th, actually on that Sunday, I went in and returned phone calls to parents for about two hours worth. By the time I left uh, my office and drove home all of one mile, about a four minute trip, uh, I had six more calls that had come in. I pulled into my driveway, I sat there and I thought to myself, okay, Peggy, like this is bigger than you realized. This is, there. the need is real, families are scared, um, parents were concerned. How are we going to get food? What are we going to do? What is this going to do to us financially? What's going to happen to my own job? And how does that impact my ability to take care of, of my kids? And so it really hit me early on that this is a big deal. Um, this is going to be something really serious and really big. And we really, you know, had to get our heads around the really just the whole scope of this. So you can imagine um, with me just kind of the logistics that would go into putting all of this together. It's a whole lot of stuff. And so that Tuesday, um, <clears throat> March the 17th, before we before our buses began to roll out in our community with our meals, um, I, I looked at our teams and I said, look, guys, you know, these are uncertain times. We don't know really what's ahead of us. We don't know what we're dealing with. If you're not if you're not comfortable being here. If you don't feel okay being here, it is okay. I, I will still love you. I'm just going to love you at home. Because um, if you're here, we got to be singularly committed to the cause. 
we all have got to pull together. And so at that moment, we all looked at each other and we all said, we're here, we're staying. Everybody stayed. We all pulled together and buses rolled out on Tuesday, March the 17th with, with bus routes throughout our community. Um, you know, families were so genuine and so kind and so sincere in their expressions of gratitude. And you know, it was a very interesting time. It has been a very interesting time to be out and about in our community. Um, remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we were not even advised to wear masks. There was so little known. We didn't wear masks for the first about three weeks or so we operated. Um, and guidance was changing daily. Things were happening um, very, very rapidly. Um, and so, you know, we would go out and be out in our, in our community. You'd be out on a bus and, you know, some, depending on the neighborhood, depending on the area, you know, lots and lots of kids and families outside, you know, all of us, we were, we were in, um, you know, a time when all, everyone was home and most, most everything was shut down. And so families were all home, um, just such kind, kind expressions of gratitude and kindness. Um, you know, some of my favorite things were milk cartons. Um, they would take our milk cartons. We had families that would do this and cut flowers from their yard you know, and use the milk cartons for vases to give us um, some kind of expression of, of a way just to show thank you. They would take political signs and repurpose them into thank yous, chalking sidewalks. Um, people were just so grateful. Um, you know, as a mother, I, I've always said, you know, if you, if you show a kindness to me, I, I appreciate that. And that means everything to me, but boy, you are kind to one of my kids and, you know, we're on another level you know, of gratitude. And so I think that that's really what we have felt and what we have lived during this time. When you're, when you're good to people, especially when you're good to people's children, um, it really, it really resonates with them and they just really feel something. And especially when you're putting yourself at risk to do that, um, it means even more. And so I, I just really, it was never an option for us, I think, to not do that, to not go to our kids. We went out every day um, and we took we took uh, lunch for that day. We did, um, you know, lots of different options, too, for our kids. It wasn't the same thing every day. Um, we tried to make it as close to week to what it was like at school. And um, and we took breakfast for the next morning. So our kids had breakfast and lunch um, every day delivered to them. And they had people that were coming to them, to their home, to their neighborhood, to their apartment complex. And they saw us in person. Kids would come out dressed in Halloween costumes. They would come in their Sunday clothes. Just, they just, it, it became a highlight of their day. And that school bus, you know, coming through the neighborhood, it just, it became this beacon of goodness and hope that um, families and our community really, really um, responded to. And so it's just, as we, as we continued through the entire time of the pandemic, um, we ended up serving um, in excess of 2.7 million uh, meals throughout our community. Um, and so it is, um, it has been an incredible, incredible journey. It is, um, it's been hot, it's been tiring. Um, you know, you are, you are in a mask, you got diesel fumes, you've got the heat. We are, we are in Georgia for crying out loud. So it is very warm. Um, and, you know, it, it just, none of that really mattered. I mean, what mattered is we had children that we could help and we were in a position to help, um, truly, truly for us. And it continues to be on a daily basis. Um, as we move into this new school year, it's a labor of love. It truly is a labor of love. Um, for me, it is a labor of love for each of our staff members. Um, and for our district um, to be able to take care of our kids and uh, to serve our community. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for your story. We are, oh, sorry, I can hear a tiny little bit of an echo, but we are so grateful for your hard work. And you're telling this story with such like connection and heart, even though you're like, it's not glamorous and there's diesel exhaust, but I want you to hear your passion for the students that you serve comes through so loudly and it is so inspiring to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work and for telling your story with us today.
um, man, we're just so, I honestly mean this, like we're so lucky to hear from people like Peggy because all last year we heard about how kids were in need of help and schools were under all this pressure. And so I do really want to say thank you, Peggy, for putting a real face and a story behind so many of the headlines that we heard last year. And um, maybe we'll hear again this year. With that, I want to bring up today's Q&A. Um, we're here with Pamela Taylor. She's our Chief Communications Officer and Marketing Officer for No Kid Hungry. And she wants to help us understand a little bit more about how all of us can help. Hi, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Aren't they, aren't we, like, aren't these stories, like, it's a lot, right? They lot are feelings. amazing. And I was just listening to, like, Tucker and George and Peggy, and I'm like, this is exactly why we do what we do at No Kid Hungry. There is a Tucker in a classroom. There are Georges in classrooms. And then we've got heroes like Peggy that are making sure all of the Tuckers and the Georges and everyone else gets what they need. So children are nourished and they're able to go swim in the Olympics and be <laughs> on you know high places and painting beautiful murals. So yes, I'm so inspired by this. Awesome. Well, we so appreciate all the work that you and your organization does. So let's get into it. You know, when the decade before the pandemic, No Kid Hungry and its partner organizations had really made huge strides in cutting childhood hunger. Um, but now some of those gains have been lost. Um, can you talk to us about that one in six number, um, kind of what the situation looks like this school year? Yeah. So, you know, in 2018, we saw some of the lowest rates of childhood hunger that we had seen in a decade. The numbers were about one in seven children, almost one in eight children were facing hunger. During the pandemic, during, you know, right around March of last year, when everything started to shut down, school doors were closing and schools were trying to do just what Peggy described. We saw that number go as close to one in four. And we've seen some improvements because of a lot of things that have happened. So the number is this year around one in six children may be living with hunger. It's it's not where we want it to be, but we're definitely starting to trend back in the right direction. That's great. That's And that's really what we're here is, right? Like you, we said before that there is a solution to these things. Um, I wanted to talk about, you guys really worked hard last year to adjust some of the um, policies at the federal and state and local levels. Can you talk a little bit more about that flexibility in distributing food and, and some of the things that you found worked and what you're trying to make durable? Exactly. So just, just like everyone else, we had to figure things out quickly. And one of the things that we learned right away is there are parameters and restrictions in place on where kids can consume food. When food is given out for school breakfast or lunch or after school meals, that needs to be done on school property. Well, what happens when schools are closed? What, what are children supposed to do? So we had to, as an organization, work with our advocacy groups, our own government relations teams, and make sure the federal government was willing to make some adjustments so that schools and parents and teachers could get food to kids that wasn't at school, that weren't at school. So we saw opportunities where parents could come by and pick up meals, for their kids without having to have their kids in their car. Initially, when this first started, the kids had to be present. That wasn't the safest and healthiest thing to do. So the federal government recognized that that was probably not the best option, lifted some waivers by the USDA so that parents could come and pick up meals for their kids and take them back home. A lot of what Peggy just described, where they got they used their school buses and they went into neighborhoods and were able to drop off meals for children. Everybody had to get super creative and figure out what policies do we need to look at differently so that we can meet the need of the people where they are during the time that we're in. A lot of those policy changes though have been implemented even beyond where we were this time last year. We've seen things like SNAP benefit increases for families so that there, there is additional money for meals and to get groceries and other things that their families need to have nutritious meals every day. We're seeing things that we just didn't know. How long were people going to be out of work? How long were we going to be able to 
provide the meals that everyone needed. So these additional SNAP benefits turned out to be really, really beneficial to families. Thank you for going into that kind of detail, because I think it's hard for people in the abstract, you know, like government policies and bureaucracies, right? It's kind of hard to picture. So just the specificity around No Kid Hungry and some of its partners saying back to the federal government, hey, um, if you have three kids in a house and they all have different class schedules and they're all different ages, it might be physically impossible for the mom to find or the dad to find an hour when they're not all in class or they all have a break and they can all pile into the car, get the food, prove they exist, that's like, right. It's a nightmare. Yeah. That's and so right. I really hear that, you know, things anyway, um, it's, it's complicated, but I, another thing that came up for a lot of us last year, in addition to being, I think, like really aware of bureaucracies is how not everybody, depending on where you volunteered or where you lived, might've imagined how widespread hunger is. And, um, after seeing so many nights on the light of news coverage of lines at food banks all across the country, do you feel like the pandemic exposed a hunger crisis? Did it create a hunger crisis? Was it already there? Help us understand kind of from your position what that it, like. it did both, right? You know, okay. hunger it oftentimes is, is referred to as a hidden crisis. You can't see hunger on people all the time. And so what the crisis, the pandemic did is it brought hunger to everybody's television, everybody's, you know, mindset, because you couldn't help, like you said, but ignore the hours long lines at food banks. What it also did is it made hunger much more visible. In other words, people started to see their neighbors in line and their kids, classmates in line and their, you know, um, friends and families from church in line people who didn't experience hunger before were certainly facing it in a way that they had never done before. And I think it was important that we tried to make sure people did not feel any kind of shame or stigma around having this, this moment that no one planned for. No one planned to lose their jobs. No one planned for schools to be closed. No one planned for everything to shut down. And we've heard many times people say, you know, we many of us are, you know, one paycheck away from a disaster. And this is what was revealed. This was what the crisis revealed. In addition to all the things that the crisis was, it revealed another crisis. And so I think people had a different understanding and appreciation for the, the crisis of hunger. And this was something that it made everyone kind of step back and say, wow, I didn't know that it was so pervasive. I didn't know that it was so close to me. I didn't know it could come into my own kitchen. And that was something that I think everyone kind of really got um, a very up close and personal view with last year. I mean, that feels very true. I know um, even, you know, I'd have Zoom calls with my family and it was a conversation I had with my siblings. We all live in different cities all throughout the West. And each of us um, talked about, you know, where were we funneling our donations and how many people it seemed like needed our help, uh, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we have time for one more question. And I want to go back to that one in six number. You know, we, we know um, it's down from at the peak of the pandemic. So we have a lot to be confident that your donations can make a difference. But talk to us for a a second about, you know, a lot of people are aware that they need to donate. How, how does our donation today, like, where does that money go? How much money have you already donated? Like, kind of give us a sense of scope. Sure. So the first thing I want to say is the generosity and just sheer humanity of America showed up last year when people saw, you know, neighbors and, and television screens full of food bank lines donations poured into No Kid Hungry, and we are so eternally grateful for everyone that showed up for us. Our corporate partners showed up for us. Partners that we had never worked with before wanted to know what can we do to help. And things that people didn't even think about, because like I said, no one had faced this before. How do we do this? What do we need? How do we transport a cafeteria full of food to neighborhoods all over our school district? So the money went towards... Um, refrigerators and portable coolers and portable heaters and some areas where 
people couldn't get to school to get the food. They needed transportation. And so school districts bought vans and shuttles so that they could load them up with bags of food so that they could go into neighborhoods just like Peggy described. There were so many things. We needed PPE, of course. We needed to make sure everyone that was going out to distribute food or hand out food, they were safe and healthy. We had inclement weather you know, all over the country, depending on where you live, it could have been really hot or super cold. And we wanted to provide funding so that they could protect themselves from the elements. This was going on every single day for about 16 to 18 months. And here we are. What we are so grateful for is since March of 2020, the numbers just came out yesterday. No Kid Hungry has been able to donate $98 million in grants to schools and school districts and community-based organizations all across the country to about 2,300 different schools and school districts. That is because people have been so very generous to us. And just like you said, if you could today or sometime in the near future, go to nokidhungry.org backslash USA Today, we would be so, so grateful. We've not seen a decline in our donations. People understand the crisis. They understand the need. And they also understand how important it is to make sure we have no kid going hungry. Oh, man, Pam, thank you so, so, so much for your time today, bringing us these messages, walking us through these talking points. Um, and thank you for doing your job every day. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Heck yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Well, everyone, we are going to bring up our next storyteller, Lydia. She is here with a story that I kind of feel like anybody who graduated from high school probably can relate to. Lydia, take it away. Hi, everybody. So I'm checking in here from Cincinnati, and Cincinnati has a well-earned reputation for just an utter disregard for anything having to do with transitional weather. We have uh, an early winter well, a late summer, an early winter, then winter, then a, a season that can best be described as winter, so like a little combo. And then from there, in the middle of May or late May, bam, it's summer. And that's sort of where I found myself in the mid-90s. It's not important the year, but the mid-90s that we're just fanning ourselves. We're uncomfortable. I'm horribly uncomfortable. Um, we've got these oscillating fans. Everyone else is trying to help out as much as they can, but it's, there's just no breeze to be had. And that's, you get used to that growing up here. That was really not the major thing I was worried about though. I was in our awards day, which we call class day with my seat, my fellow seniors and I, we were sitting there. This was the end of our on-campus experience. We were going to we were kind of gone because there's no point in making seniors come in that last week, let's be honest. And then from there, we were gonna graduate in a few weeks. So I'm sitting on stage, I'm sitting next to the salutatorian, I'm sitting next to the class president, a couple of faculty, all this. And I'm just kind of looking out at my partners in growing up, right? So there's Rich and, and I just met him in high school. He was sort of a late addition to our crew. There's Lewis and Fred and Christy and Catrice and Amy, and these are all my junior high school and seventh and eighth grade survivors. And that is the only way to describe getting out of middle school as survivors. And then I see Tara and Paul, who we met in second grade, and, and we just frankly just never got away from each other throughout our entire school's career. We kind of were all around each other. And it was a family feel because we had all met each other's parents by this point. We had been given advice by each other's parents and told that they were going to call one of our parents and we didn't behave ourselves. So, you know, this was a big deal. And I held it together. I'm kind of getting kind of misty eyed. And I'm like, no, do, do not cry. Pull it together, girl. And I did until Paul decides to come up and hug everyone. And at this point, I just lose it. I mean, just everything that I had been feeling and just nervous, like this is it and everything because in my brain, I was absolutely never going to see these people again. Well, in about two weeks, we graduated and we dried our tears and cried a little bit more and, and dried them again. And then we all kind of went off on our separate ways, right? Just never to see each other again. Um, and, and life kind of made its own plans for us. So here's another thing about my hometown. It's not a small town, it's not a small city, but it has a hometown feel. So I like to say that there are about six degrees of Kevin Bacon and there are two degrees of Cincinnati. 
So you run into EP, EP people just all the time. I mean, it's just really not a big deal. And, and you don't realize how small it is until you do grow up. And what happens is eventually you get these feelings of comparison. And, and this will kind of happen with me. So the thing is, and I'm observing the rules, this is not an educational talk, but I, I have to squeeze in at least one science fact. It is scientifically proven that when you look your absolute worst, you are going to run into someone from your past. I don't make the rules, it's just science. So this is where I found myself. I'm walking into a Macy's, it's summer, I'm in my cop jean and frizzy haired glory, and I see this shock of blonde wavy hair, and I'm like, oh my God, that's Christy. And I thought I said it to myself. I said it louder than I expected. Her hearing is obviously much better than mine. And she immediately turns around and goes, how have you been? How's it going? And I'm like, this is good. At least I wasn't just rocking up to someone and totally mistaken identity. But then the other thing is, oh, God, this is the introvert's nightmare. What am I supposed to say? Right. Here comes the small talk. So we kind of talk a little bit and we kind of fall back into old times and a lot of it is have you heard from robin whatever happened with fred is anybody in contact with fred what's going on with lewis and then we kind of veer over into this subject that i was kind of you know dreading because i look at her and she's in her security op officer outfit she's working her way into law enforcement she had been interested in that in high school um and she's engaged she's doing great and then she asked me what i was doing and I gave as, as high level of, a, of an update as I could. And, you know, we, we move on and it's fine. And so, again, this, this continues to happen. I run into people. And what I always was amazed with was just how well adulthood seemed to be suiting them. I mean, they had all of their, you know, adulthood accoutrement, if you will. They had their houses or their really nice apartments and they had their kids and spouses and all of this. And they wanted to know how I was doing. We would catch up and that would be really fun. And then they wanted to know how I was doing. And I would kind of put on a brave face. But the fact of the matter was that I had not transitioned into adulthood quite as well as I'd expected. Um, you know, I was this former valedictorian and voted most likely to succeed. And I had no clue what I wanted to be when I grew up, none at all. And so it, it just was hard for me to handle that. And I wasn't doing well. And I thought that they knew that I wasn't doing well. And then even worse, that they knew that I knew that they knew I wasn't doing well. And so it became an entire thing, right? There was all of this thought. Uh, I would go home and go, man, I bet they're wondering what happened to her. She has such promise. So eventually I go back to school. I figure out what I want to do. And they would go, well, that's brave if I ran into people because I never really stopped running into people. And I'm like, sure, brave's a word. We'll go with brave. Um, and they're, you know, you'll be fine. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, I mean, yeah, maybe, but then I've told you this. And what if I never figure it out? Because this is a totally foreign subject for me. And now I have to explain it to you as to what blew up in my face later. And again, it was just a problem. Well, as I look back, really, I had always had this sort of internal voice in the back of my head. And I told myself, well, you know, it's okay. I'm high strung. I'm a high strung person. I have type A tendencies. It pushes me to be better. No one pushes me harder than me. And I was super proud of that. Well, the fact of the matter is that whatever it was pushing me and however it was pushing me, it wasn't doing it in a healthy way. And that became very clear in 2017. So by 2017, I was in my career. I was pretty established. And, you know, this whole Internet thing that we were kind of vaguely aware of at the time, it, it turns out to be kind of a big deal. So we're on Facebook. We'd all reconnected. I said what I said. We're on Facebook. Do not come at me for that. Um, and I'm preparing to hit this milestone age. And I'm just taking as you do when you hit those ages, you know, I'm taking stock of my life. Where am I? What's my next move? I, I knew I had to make some changes. Um, just to move forward in my career and then personally and everything else. And just literally every facet of my life was in transition. Well, this internal voice that I had relied on in a, frankly, a very unhealthy way to push me, it became unbearable. It, it was overwhelming. It was keeping me from sleeping. It was keeping me from making decisions, let alone good, good decisions. And it just it just wasn't good. So I remembered Rich because, again, we were connected and I needed to talk to someone. I knew that I knew I needed to talk to someone because this was clearly not healthy. And he had become a psychologist. Again, one of my friends who always knew what they wanted to be when they grew up. And I wanted to talk to someone who knew me well, but not so much that it would be awkward. Like, I don't see them all the time. Right. So I, I am him. I open a messenger and I'm like, hey, I'm going through some stuff. This is what I'm dealing with. Is this normal? 
and he goes, well, okay, let's, let's talk about this. And so of course it obviously wasn't normal, but he was nice enough not to come out and go, no, no, it's not. So he convinced me to talk to someone. He convinced me to tell my family how I was feeling and everything. And that was a big deal. And it was also very scary to say out loud because like, what did that say about me? What, what kind of person was I? Um, so eventually I go talk to someone. I learned that this internal voice that I had thought was such an awesome thing was actually something called anxiety. And I learned how to deal with it, how to control it. Um, you know, what, what thing foods even that weren't good. And then I, I, mean, I do pretty well with it actually now that I know what it is and it has a name and it's not a crutch anymore. But I recently told him, I said, you know, I'm so grateful to you for, for talking to me and taking your time out and kind of doing it without getting a dime. That was really, you didn't have to do that. I mean, we haven't seen each other in person in years. I mean, we see each other mostly online. And he replied and said, you know, I'm glad to hear you're doing better because of the fact that, you know, the world is just a better place with you in its sights. Just me. And that was a huge, huge deal to me because of the fact of it wasn't associated with literally anything else about me and these accomplishments that I had thought was really the meaning of who I was. It was just me and my personality and, and everything and just being present. And so every now and again, I'll post something about being stressed and everything and he'll kind of check in like, hey, how you doing? Or He'll just ping me every now and again, even if I haven't posted anything, you know, and it just shows that I haven't, you can't fool people, you know, right. And that know you. And so I, I still see people. I still bump into people. We got together for dinner um, a while ago, one of the first times in person. And even though they got after me for wearing sweats and I don't care, um, you know, we just kind of went back to our cafeteria selves, right? We were just hanging out. Some of the spouses probably could have lived without the high school antics, but whatever. And, I'm just so grateful for that connection that I have with these people that remember, and I remember them as well, who we were before we had mortgages and jobs and all of these expectations of adulthood that really kind of hide, doesn't change, but it certainly hides and cloaks the core of who you are and your dreams and everything. And I just, I'm so grateful to that. And I really hope to continue those, those times with them and to just continue that connection and, Really, I just, I'm so grateful to it. And so this is kind of a love letter to my high school colleagues, if you will. Thank you. Lydia, thank you so much for your story. There's a couple of things I really want to shout out for you, which is that I didn't know that there was a word for the season that feels like it should be spring, but it's obviously still winter. <laughs> yeah, sprinter. sprinter. Yeah. It's it, it, every year. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I really, really appreciate that because I'm from uh, Indiana originally, so I was feeling Oh, that. yeah, you know. But you know the pain. <laughs> I, it's just gray. Um, mm -hmm. The season is called gray. Um, but I also really want to say there are so many of us who can, I'm sure, relate to um, mistaking anxiety for a personality trait or a friend in our heads. Um, and your courage to like just tackle it head on, accept it for what it is and like kind of rebuild your sense of self. I know I'm not the only person that saw myself reflected in that journey. And um, I don't know, I just want to shout out because I really appreciate Thanks. that also, you know, like your connection to your high school friends and your self-awareness and your like Macy's shame. It's just a lot, a lot of, <laughs> lot of touch points that people can relate to. I'm not saying you're ashamed of being at Macy's. Macy's no, no, it was, it was way before the hair gel and the wee dot came out and I knew what to do with all this. Yeah, it was humid. <laughs> so I, oh my gosh. It's a struggle. <laughs> well, Lydia, your story is just like keeping it real and has so much that's so relatable. So I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yesterday, as the worst of the pandemic raged, childhood hunger skyrocketed. Even now, one in six kids may be living with hunger. Today, we start rebuilding, and tomorrow, we'll give them everything they need to grow up happy and strong. For their tomorrow, we're reimagining a world where every kid has the food they need to thrive. Visit nokidhungry.org slash rebuild to find out what you can do for kids in your community. Awesome. We are now going to go to our next storyteller. Juan Carlos is coming to us from California where they don't have summer sp or spring winter 
Um, Hello. Take it away, Hi, we're how, excited for your story. How, how are you guys doing today? Um, let me take you back to 1986. 1986 was the year that changed my life forever. I grew up in the south side of San Bernardino, California. It's a neighborhood that has many, has many challenges, but those challenges have made me the man that I am today. And for that, I will forever be grateful to my community. When my father left us that year, my mother was pregnant with her second child and struggling financially. Uh, we were renting a one bedroom apartment in San Bernardino. And for many years, I will blame my mother for my father leaving us. I felt that she was at fault and that was not even the case. My father left us for another woman. It was very tragic for me. It was difficult for me. I was only seven years old. I was just a kid. I didn't know how to handle that. I thought that my parents would always be together, that marriage is forever. Uh, I couldn't believe that they had separated. I was like, oh. But I remember the day that my father left. Um, I remember he was going to work, I believe. But I remember I ran to him and I hugged him, hugged him tightly. And I said, Dad, I love you. Well, that was the last time I saw my father. He never came back. I was seven again, seven years old. And every day I would run out to see if my father would be coming in. No. And um, again, I blame my mother. And I remember telling my mother that I hated her and I hated her and hate's a strong word. Um, and now we have become a single parent household. And as a child, you don't know what you're saying. You can't control your emotions, but I will forever ask my mother, Olga Vargas, for forgiveness and blaming her for the breakup with my father. I now understand marriage is not forever. However, marriage can be forever with hard work, commitment, communication, and respect for one another. So I think of that all the time. I'm currently entering my 18th year as a teacher and teaching is my dream job. Um, my teacher, Ms. Linda Brown, my fifth grade teacher changed my life. She made me believe in myself. She gave me the encouragement. She gave me hope that I can become anything in this world. And she was my fifth grade teacher. I teach fifth grade because of her. Uh, this year I'm teaching a four or five combo uh, here in Rialto Unified School District in the city of Rialto. I would like to tell you that many teachers are working tirelessly to accommodate student academic growth. We have the biggest challenge this year because our students have been out of the classroom for over a year and a half. So we have a lot to catch up. And I always think uh, as teachers, we always feel overwhelmed. We have meetings, IEPs, we have lesson plans, we got a grade. It's just a never ending struggle for teachers and God bless teachers, my colleagues, you guys work hard. You guys work so hard. I see you. I know many parents, parents now see you too. So can you imagine when I was told two years ago that we'll be serving breakfast in the classroom, in our own classroom? I was livid. I was mad. I was upset. I was frustrated. I was thinking another thing? For reals, one more thing? So I'm thinking about, I'm not even thinking about the nurturing part. I'm not even thinking about the mental health for our students. I'm thinking, adding one more thing, I think I was the biggest advocate for not having breakfast in the classroom. So definitely not proud of that. And let me tell you, I was so wrong, like really wrong. Breakfast in the classroom has been a hit in my, at my school site and in my district. I've seen the benefit of breakfast in the classroom. I'm so grateful for the No Kid Hungry organization for making sure our children are eating. I noticed this particular family of five. Uh, there's eight in the fa uh, five of eight children. Uh, five have come through our school. Uh, four of the four of the eight have been my previous students. I noticed that they were going through the same issues that I went through as a child. The parents are clearly going through a separation, and I wonder how were they feeling. Um, they were always late, they were tardy, they were absent. But when we started breakfast in the classroom, they were coming in. They were not missing. They started changing. Attendance started changing. Um, they weren't coming as late. 
They were coming in early. They wanted to sit with their friends. So the benefits that we're seeing with breakfast in the classroom, the students want to interact with each other. They want to communicate with each other. I think us as human beings, we just have that, the urge to communicate. We need to see each other. I know I missed it. I miss being in my class, talking to my colleagues. Good morning. How are you doing? So I would just like to say that breakfast in the classroom at first, we were looking at that like, mm, I, I was not feeling it. But let me tell you, it's an amazing, it's amazing when you see it in action. Uh, currently, we have students who have roles. We change it, leadership roles. We have a schedule. Uh, we I can, Right now, currently in my class, we got the fourth graders going on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the fifth graders going on Tuesday and Thursday. So it's a system and they love it. They love taking, they love taking initiative. Uh, I have definitely, definitely seen the change in behavior. Uh, I see this particular family improve in a lot of ways. They're coming to school, like I said, very early now. Uh, and at first, I got to tell you, uh, passing out breakfast, I was thinking uh, it's going to be really messy. It's going to be not good. <laughs> I was definitely, that couldn't be further from the truth. I was so wrong. Students are eating breakfast, they're coming in, they're excited, they're talking to their friends, they're communicating, that's what we need. And I always think about that, like, we never really realize what we have until it's gone. And when the pandemic hit and I was at home teaching, I definitely miss my class. I miss my culture, I miss my students. And I think now we appreciate more of what we have. I, I think it's the passion that we have for, in my case and many colleagues, the passion to teach. I have my dream job. This is what I went to school for, to become a teacher, to inspire and motivate these students, to tell them, yes, you can. You can accomplish anything you want. And, and to my teachers who were there for me and made me believe I'm forever grateful, grateful for giving me the opportunity for me to grow, grow and become, become a great educator and someone that really cares for our students. In conclusion, I would like to say thank you for this opportunity to share my story with the nation and around the world. I can also relate to the students of mine, uh, what they're going through, such as hunger, mental health, single parent household and poverty, uh, especially in the Hispanic community. Um, back in the 80s, it wasn't really a positive thing, thing to look at a woman uh, raising two boys, two gentlemen. Uh, my brother Jesse and I, uh, we have become successful because my brother has pushed us to be successful. Uh, and I'm excited. My brother's a high school counselor in San Diego, and I teach and we're educators and my mom would always push that. And I see that with our parents right now, they're pushing their children, hey, go to school, work hard, get your dream job. And I always think mothers, you guys are amazing because you guys are always looking forward and always pushing your children to be better. Uh, and I think like I see the similarities between my mom and some of my students' parents. They just wanted to be able to provide for their families. They would like to give the children the opportunity for a better life. I mean, who doesn't want that for the children? I think we all want that for our kids, to have a better life, to not live in poverty, to live, to travel, to do anything you want. I remember window shopping. Window shopping is you will see it, but you wouldn't buy it. And I think that to me was very motivational. Um, I think like for our parents, to those parents out there who sacrifice so much, uh, you sacrifice your mental health for your children. Thank you. Our parents who will go, will starve, before their, their children starve. I think to myself, my, remember my mother, God bless her heart, she wouldn't eat to make sure that we ate. And I think many parents out there, you guys, I know exactly what you go through. And to those moms who are single moms and you guys are fighting the good cause, continue fighting the good cause, because at the end of the day, your children will be successful. That's a promise. And I would like to thank No Kid Hungry for investing in our community, in the city of Rialto, for taking a risk in our community, for letting our community benefit for not going hungry. I've seen the program work firsthand. I've seen it with my students. I've seen it with my parents. And I just want to say thank you. And I also would like to challenge, I would like to challenge my colleagues out there to give Breakfast in the Classroom an opportunity. Don't be like me, be a negative person, and be like, another thing? No, it's probably one of the best things that happened in my class. 
And I just want to say thank you for listening to my story. Thank you. Oh, man. Carlos, thank you so much. Thank you for your story. We felt it. I know you're feeling it right now. I appreciate your service. I appreciate your heart. I appreciate your mom. Um, thank you so much for connecting with us so authentically and helping us understand what the work of connecting kids with food looks like in real life. Because again, like if we're not in the classroom, right, we don't know. We don't know how the magic happens. So we appreciate you inviting us into your classroom and into your heart. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, we have one more storyteller who's going to bring it home for us. I'd like to bring up Chris right now. Are you here with us, Chris, still? I am. I'm still here. Chris, yes. we open strong, we close strong. Sweet. Are you ready? Awesome. It's you. Thank you so much. All right. Perfect. So at the age of five, um, my mother dropped me and my four siblings off at my great grandmother's house. Uh, many factors could attribute it to this, uh, her being a single mother raising five boys, uh, to her having little to no work experience or no college experience. Um, unfortunately, that's how it was. Um, my great grandmother took me and my siblings in and life was good. Let's picture, so let's picture a Southern black woman uh, sweet as could be, but as stubborn as a Texas Longhorn. Um, hot, warm meals every morning uh, as either Earth, Wind, or Fire, Earth, Wind, and Fire, or uh, Aretha Franklin plays uh, to set the mood for the morning. Um, with sweet kisses to instill the value of love to Sunday morning churches, to Wednesday Bible study, to planting in the garden, to going fishing. Um, life was good. Life was amazing. Um, unfortunately, life, we must all learn pain and sorrow. Um, my grandmother, pat, my great grandmother passed away when I was 10 years old uh, from lung cancer. Um, with no immediate family to take me or my siblings in, we were all separated and sent into foster care. Um, being 10 years old, afraid, lonely, abandoned, um, I, it was a stressful, it was a stressful time growing up. Um, I would, I would disrupt from a lot of different foster homes. Uh, I would either try to damage property, uh, cause harm or attempt to run away. Um, I, I wasn't able to focus in school. I wasn't able to have friends. I wasn't able to, to have sleepovers. Um, it just wasn't a, a, a smooth setting for me. So I, I created, very hostile environments for me and the foster families that I lived with to where um, I couldn't stay. Uh, so at the age of 15, I was sent to a residential facility uh, boot camp for foster children. Um, at this facility, uh, I was in the middle of nowhere in a wooden cabin. Uh, it was a military style boot camp with um, eight other uh, or 12 other uh, children in this cabin. Uh, we were up at 5 a.m. in the morning for PT. Uh, we would go down and have breakfast down in the chow hall, and then we would go and have school on on site as well too, and then um, go back to our cabin and just do the days out there. Pretty much the goal of the program was for us to become stable children uh, and to provide us with some sense of therapy to allow us to help with our emotions. Uh, so while in this program, there's phases that you go through to get to the big uh, cabin to where different foster families and adopted families would come in and vet potential children that they would possibly want to adopt or have living with them. Uh, while I eventually graduated out of my cabin, I eventually got there and I had a family come and visit me quite often. Um, and while they were coming to visit me quite often, uh, we gained a, a great relationship, you know, they went fishing, they gardened, you know, they were stubborn, you know, but also sweet. Um, so they asked me the question if I wanted to move out uh, out of this program and go live with them. And I said, yeah, let's go. So I pretty much moved in with them, you know, I uh, was going back to church, uh, participated inside of the church orchestra, uh, was doing well in school, took my ACT, got a 28 on my first time. Uh, life was good. Um, it was so good that 
um, my after my first year uh, living with them, they asked me if I would like to be adopted. And I told them, yeah, most definitely. Uh, this is the most stable I've been in years. Uh, I feel that life is, is great. Um, so a year, uh, a month goes by within that process. Um, fortunately, we had a sit down at the table one one night and uh, the discussion came up on where we were at with the adoption. And unfortunately, we're, we were unable to go with the adoption due to the foster, the foster wife's mother not wanting a black child to join the family. So they were really questioning the options on what to do next, knowing that they needed to tell me that. So my options were to either stay with them uh, in their foster home or to go ahead and move out um, and with them and with me moving out that they would close down their foster home um, and not be foster parents anymore. I really didn't care. I was hurt. I, I was ready to mess some things up. I, I was in pain uh, and I believe my state workers and the state knew um, therefore, they sent me with another foster, fam uh, foster family, um, and at the time, uh, this, this, this family just met me with, with resiliency and understanding and, and gave me hope. Um, also, having the same values, taking me fishing, uh, uh, helping me to join the football team, you know, building new friends, you know, studying you know, giving me relationships, building relationships with teachers as they were prepping me to go to college. You know, uh, this kid that they've never met, you know, come in uh, doing well in tests and just for him to go through so much stressors. You know, this is a student that we want to help get there. So my um, guidance counselor um, told me like, hey, maybe I should apply for, for college uh, uh, foster care children in my state get college for free. I was like, hmm good idea you know i've never thought about going to college but it's definitely a good experience if i don't have to pay is what they tell you but uh, <laughs> if i didn't have to pay so I, I i applied i got in and it was a remarkable experience you know freshman year was ready ready to go hard you know i think every freshman in undergrad goes through this am i going to study or am i going to party i chose to party uh <laughs> Freshman year, I partied so much. I was on academic probation. I was facing a 1.5 a 1.5 GPA, um, in which was not. I was telling that I was definitely. I could tell that I was wasting an opportunity. Um, I, I had a had an epiphany. I had to figure out why I was here. How could I not let these teachers and my guidance counselors down for helping me catch back up to my um, curriculum? to get me ready for college. Uh, therefore, I started to meet out with mentors, getting involved um, with the university as I seen the more students that were involved with the university were also going to the library to go study. So as I would go hang out with them, I wasn't going out to the bar, Go, I would go to the library to go study. So those actually helped me um, instill great value. So. I eventually pulled myself out of academic probation. I, I, I went into a, I joined a wonderful fraternity uh, at the university uh, and was able to graduate uh, with the, with a 3.5 GPA. Um, it was amazing. My college experience has helped me to where um, I've, I've been able to leave right after college and move to Denver, Colorado to work in technology with a poli sci and economics degree, not having any, uh, experience, it was just an opportunity, an opportunity just to try and learn new things. So a as we go through this thing called life, you know, it's never just about just this one person, you know, there's multiple steps and there's multiple communities, you know, it's not just this one village raises a child. There's multiple villages, multiple states and multiple people that, 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 that is here um, to help one another. Um, and thank you guys so much for hearing my story. Um, I think, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you guys so much. Chris, thank you so much. Thank oh you. my God. Oh my thank gosh. You. you painted such, such, such vivid scenes. I mean, we were at the breakfast table oh, with yeah. you and your grandma. I mean, you are a natural storyteller. Thank you so much for closing the show. It's so much heart. And I mean, truly like a really inspirational and awesome story. Like. Big finish, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
Awesome. I want to say a quick thank you also to Fairytale Brownies. They've been our sponsor for years now, and they have, um, in the inside times right now, they have sent all of our storytellers a little thank you box of brownies. But they're a business based right here in Phoenix, Arizona, that in the normal times um, gives every single person who attends one of our live shows a free brownie if they're a subscriber to any of our USA Today network um, newspapers. So we always want to say thank you to Fairytale Brownies. They can help you start your school year off right, or like tonight's show, they can help every story have a sweet ending. So thanks so much, Fairytale Brownies, for your support. Now I want to bring up all of our storytellers so that we can thank everybody. And, and Pamela also, we want to bring her up. I want to say thank you all so much for sharing your stories and your heart, raising some money for No Kid Hungry, and raising awareness. Thank you all for being here. Right. Awesome. And thank you so much to our audience for being on this storytelling journey with us tonight. We so appreciate your interest and your time. Thanks so much.